So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. My name is Beatrice Greenstein. I am an infectious disease physician and researcher based at Fundação Oswaldo Cruz in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And I am with the International AIDS Society president. I would like to welcome to this uh, webinar that is part of our IAS Educational Fund. Uh, our webinar is titled MPOX in Focus, Global Insights on uh, Prevention and Treatment. It is really a great honor for me to moderate today's webinar that, are, that is featuring such distinguished speakers and a large amount, a, a large number of participants joining us online. It's really amazing to have you all here. So on August 14, 2024, the WHO declared MPOX a public health emergency of international concern for the second time in two years. Just one day earlier, on August 13, 2024, the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Africa CDC, declared MPOX a public health emergency of continental security, emphasizing the escalating threat posed by the outbreak on the continent and the need for a coordinated global, global health response. The 100 days mission for MPOX officially began on August 14, following these declarations by WHO and Africa CDC. Despite major announcements over the past 15 days, such as the donation of 2 million vaccines from the USA, Gavi and UNICEF, as well as the approval of 128 million by the pandemic fund to support 10 affected countries, significant challenges remain. There is still limited diagnostic capacity to confirm all suspected cases and no antivirals have yet been proven effective. Equity in response is critical. It requires both policy and financial support to ensure that affected communities, particularly those people at most vulnerability, have access to vaccines, diagnostics, and care. Effective, effective response strategies must involve engaging communities and at-risk groups in surveillance, contact tracing, transmission prevention, and care. We must also confront the stigma, especially in settings where populations such as LGBTQ plus communities may fear seeking help due to the threat of criminal, criminal prosecution. The increasing incidence and evolving nature of MPOX cases are not just a regional issue for Africa, but a global health threat. It demands the coordinated attention and action of leaders around the world. Our aim for this webinar is to improve your understanding of MPOX prevention and treatment while encouraging global cooperation and community engagement by providing updates on the latest data and guidance on MPOX prevention and treatment options, especially for those most affected, including people living with HIV, enhancing the global urgency of a coordinated and equitable response, including for MPOX vaccination campaigns to be urgently scaled up across the African continent and other affected regions, highlighting the role of communities in MPOX monitoring, prevention and treatment, and sharing insights from the field on current challenges and experiences in prevention, and also sharing updates from ongoing clinical trials. I would very much like to welcome today's speakers, Meg Doherty from the WHO, Shema Tarek from the UK, Dimi Ogoina from Nigeria, Jean, Professor Jean-Jacques Muyembe from the DRC, Mayara Seco from Brazil, and uh, Dr. William Fisher from the USA. Thank you so much for all of you for being here. I will, our team will be posting each speaker's bio in the webinar chat box at the start of their presentation so that you can get to know them a little better. Thank you all, thanks very much also to our donors, Vive Healthcare and Gilead, uh, Gilead Sciences. So uh, I would like just to share with you some housekeeping rules for the webinar. Please note that due to the number, the large number of attendees, all participants are currently muted. 
We have planned uh, enough time after the presentations for a Q&A session. So please send any questions that you may have for our speakers focusing on today's to topics in the Q&A box at any time. If your question is for a specific speaker, please indicate their name when typing your question. You will notice that there is a thumbs up symbol when someone will ask a question in the Q&A box. If you have a similar question or find this question important, please click on this thumbs up sign to help us prioritize the questions. In case you are having any issues with Zoom, you can fix find additional guidance provided in the chat box. And please also send us any technical questions you may have. In the chat box, please feel free also to let us know from which country you are connecting and what time it is for you. We love seeing some interaction in the, in the chat. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first presenter, uh, Dr. Meg Doherty, who is the Director for Global HIV, Hepatitis, and STI programs at the WHO in Switzerland. Meg will be presenting to us on WHO updates on MPOX-related epidemiology and guidance on prevention, diagnostics, and treatment. Meg, please, the floor is yours. You have eight minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Beatrice, and I hope you can see my screen well. If not, uh, let me know. Um, and I'll be running through these slides as fast as possible. There are many of them. And I, one caveat is I'm sharing updates as of the 22nd of September. We'll have new data today. So when I give the slides in, I'll be providing the updated information. So you're probably all aware that um, we have MPOX outbreaks that are happening around the world. They're different, they're complex, different strains. And what we do know right now, what was prompted our fake in August was the uh, clade 1B coming out of both DRC as well as in, um, uh, and in Burundi. And it, the clade 2B, which you knew from the multi-country outbreak um, in 2022, first originated out of Nigeria and then spread around the world. Now 1B is a new clade coming that we just first saw and, uh, in, D in DRC in September, 2023. This slide is busy, but it gives you an overview of all the characteristics of the MPOX in the last six months across clades one and two. And what you'll see in the African region is it really mirrors the uh, population breakdown. And, and uh, whereas in all the other outbreaks in other parts of the WHO regions, it's been mainly with men and not equally female, female, and across age ranges. But still, in large, when we look at the case profiles, uh, we still have, because we have both an outbreak of 2B that is concurrently happening, as well as 1B that's happening, that we have sexual transmission and person-to-person -person transmission as the most major route across all cases, and also MSM and people living with HIV having a high preponderance in the case profiles that we have reported to us. Now we don't have case profiles on every single case. So when we start to look more closely at what's going on now in Africa, we've seen over the years, and others will speak to this, clade one in Central um, Africa, clade two in West Africa, and now we see a mixing where can we can have clade one a and 2B in DRC in different parts of the country, as well as clade 1A and 1B in the yellow around uh, other parts of the world, and where we have seen some exporting of the clade 1B to other countries through travel, through persons. And a focus on DRC and Africa shows that we have 17 countries that are now reporting in um, on MPOX, 14 countries affected just in 2024 and in the last 90 days, nine countries in the past two weeks. And we know that the numbers continue to increase. The majority of these cases are in DRC and Burundi. We've had in Africa, clade 1B found both in Morocco and also in India um, uh, outside just recently. This shows the epidemic curve, which uh, is just for 2023 to 2024, where you see not an exponential rise in DRC now and a little bit more of a leveling off, 
but an increase in Burundi as well. And we know there's a lag. There's also a difference between what we say suspected cases and confirmed cases. And right now, the suspected cases are the very high numbers, whereas confirmed cases run in the, in the thousands, 5,000 and DRC, uh, et cetera. So I think that's an important thing to keep in mind because we're now, we're now reporting on both suspected and confirmed to be able to ensure that we have adequate view on the case fatality rate. So if we add in suspected and not yet uh, confirmed by lab, we have 31,000 uh, cases with a case fatality rate around 2.7. Not as high, but not as low as that has been presented in, in lay literature. We are also seeing that uh, in DRC in particular, and maybe not in other countries, we only have a testing rate of approximately 45% uh, percent, um, have been tested. And then when tested, only 55% of those are positive. So we know that there are other, dis other vesicular infections presenting as, as uh, MPOX that have to be ruled out during um, the testing phase. So overall, this gives you this table here on the right shows us for plague 1B in particular, DRC, we have about 3,500 cases, Burundi, about 700. And as you can see, only 22 deaths in those who are confirmed. And this will get updated as I am sure when I have the data coming in from today. And again, in DRC, we still also have clade 1B happening, 1A with 1B together. And I know I'm sorry about all these clades, but it's important to note that they have different potential um, vectors and different um, populations where they're seeing the highest number. Uh, so it's always important to think about this. And when we look at the provinces that are, were traditionally 1A and in children, we are seeing um, that there we don't have as many coming positive when they are um, tested, as well as for Kivu. Whereas in, uh, when we go to Burundi, we see almost all of them testing positive because they're testing most of their cases. We've also looked at occupation over time. Does, is that a proxy for what their risk groups are or transmission is? And we can see that in early on, there was a predominance of sex worker report, but we do know that the majority of this is happening through person-to-person -person contact, as well as sex work and other sex contact. But in children, there's probably a, a movement um, from adults into children, maybe in the household. And so we also believe that it's very important that once in the household, that there's isolation, there's home care, et cetera we're not stating that children are getting infected sexually. So I know that that's come up at different times, but what we're saying is perhaps there's sexual person-to-person -person contact happening um, in adults, and then later that is in secondary transmission to children, and then potentially children to children transmission, and even back transmission to, to animals and animal reservoirs. I'm sure we may hear more about that. So just to say epidemiology is always shifting and changing. What we're doing um, in our department, we're part of the response. We're also looking at, especially early on, getting out guidance around um, public health advice for sex workers and how to reduce uh, their risk of, of acquisition and transmission. But also we're encouraging testing for HIV and to integrate both HIV and syphilis testing into the programs because we know people who are immunosuppressed or who have unidentified advanced HIV disease are often finding themselves with more severe MPOX. And we don't have a good handle on that in the DRC and Burundi outbreaks at all. Last to say, I'm gonna in my last minute talk about the guidance we have out there. There's a plethora of information on the website. We have what we're driven by what's called our global and continental preparedness and response plans. These are very much aligned. We have the same indicators going into countries and they're focusing on a response that looks at collaborative surveillance, detection of cases, community protection, safe and scalable care, equitable access to countermeasures, emergency coordinations. And these are all part of the new HEPR and the new approach to addressing um, in, uh, outbreaks. 
I'm going to run through this quickly. We have vaccine therapeutics and diagnostics and products that are either going through pre-qualification and getting out to countries. And if you follow the media, you'll know that we have sent out multiple um, PCR tests. Uh, we would advise that antigen testing does not do a good job. They're very, in, they don't have high accuracy. So we, we are suggesting that testing be done through PCR-based testing expert or otherwise in a laboratory. And there's tools and guidance for that. For safe and scalable care right now, we're really focusing on infection prevention and WASH and um, a supportive care in homes and also separation, especially for those in congregate settings. Treatment from uh, te tecovirumab, we may hear about that, but it, the new studies have not shown a huge benefit, if any benefit, so we need to know when and how to use tecovirumab, although it's uh, available under a MURI protocol. For vaccination, three phases. First phase is to stop the outbreak, later to expand protection and protect the future. There's guidance on SAGE, and we do know that the vaccination should be starting momentarily in DRC, already started in Rwanda, already started in Nigeria. We have something called the MCM net, which really includes the access and allocation mechanisms to be able to bring all of those countermeasures to countries. As you can see, it's a multi-partner uh, endeavor. And we have recommendations on critical risk communication, community engagement, um, and certainly in the, in the regions, we know there's a lot of lack of awareness, vulnerable groups, people living with HIV, key populations. There are some gaps in communication and we look for you to help us as we move forward, identifying community representatives. And I'll stop there because I think I'm over time by a minute or so and back to you and I will share these slides for your further um, uh, for you to look at further. Thank you. Back to you, Beatrice. Thank you so much, Meg, for the great presentation. It's an amount, um, amazing amount of work that is being done, but we we know that uh, we still have so much to do and we really appreciate your leadership. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce Sherma, Sherma Tariq. Sherma is a uh, Principal Clinical Research Fellow at University College London's Institute for Global Health in the UK, where she co-directs the M MSc, the Master's Program in Applied Infectious Diseases Epidemiology. Shema is also an honorary consultant in HIV and sexual health at the Mortimer Market Center. And Shema will be speaking uh, to us on the importance of ensuring a community-led and equitable uh, response to MPOX. Shema, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Let me just move this into a slideshow. Hello, everyone from London, wherever you are, and um, thank you to IAS for inviting me to give this talk. And I think hopefully it will be a useful follow-on from Meg's um, important overview of the current situation in MPOX. So I'll be talking to you about the importance of community-led and equitable responses to MPOX. I'm sure that I don't need to tell people on this webinar how complex a problem MPOX is. We can view it as an eco-bio-psychosocial problem, like most infectious diseases. Biological in that it depends on the pathogen, host factors, vaccination and treatment social in that we know the role of stigma, access to healthcare, social determinants of health and the importance of health messaging. Psychological, because again, we talk, we can think about internalized stigma, the importance of health beliefs and health behaviors and also trust in institutions and experts. And finally, this all has to sit within a context of the ecological environment. So things such as climate change, animal reservoirs, habitat disruption, increased urbanization, food insecurity, and also biodiversity loss, these things which put us into more contact with animal reservoirs and increase our risk and uh, change transmission dynamics of MPOX. So let's dig a bit deeper. And I really want to, in this slide, focus on the key socio-cultural challenges. So we know that MPOX predominantly affects marginalized groups and that also these marginalized groups may find it difficult to access healthcare or access prevention. 
Furthermore, we know that MPOX carries with it the risk of stigma and discrimination. We have seen that in the data so far in uh, high income settings, and there's emerging data from low and middle income settings regarding the stigma and discrimination um, enacted towards people with MPOX. As Meg rightly pointed out, there's issues in terms of information. How are we getting information out to the populations and communities that are affected by the current MPOX outbreak? Um, how do we raise awareness? But also, how do we counter misinformation and disinformation? We are living at a point in time where we have unprecedented amounts of information sharing um, online and offline, and not all of that accurate. There's been a real rise in the mistrust of institutions that has been amplified in the current global political situation, but also um, since uh, COVID pandemic. And that increasingly is going to affect how we roll out public health messaging and how we engage communities and in interventions. And finally, all of us will be aware of the existing global health inequities that have really been exposed not only by the COVID pandemic, but now in the MPOX pandemic. So how do we address these problems? I think the problems that I've highlighted are complex. They go beyond the biological and what they demand are multi-sector, multidisciplinary approaches. And at the heart of that is community. So why does community involvement matter? Communities bring with them the knowledge and the expertise that we as healthcare professionals, as policymakers, as scientists may not have. It is important to work with community to build trust, to show that we are being transparent. And there has never been a point in history where that is more important to rebuild trust in institutions. Working with communities, being guided by communities means that our interventions and our health promotion will have not only cultural relevance, but local relevance. We have seen how MPOX disproportionately affects people from marginalized groups. These are the groups that are least likely to access interventions to be included in research. And the only way of reaching these marginalized groups is by working with communities, working with grassroots organizations and people on the ground. There is an urgency to counter the stigma associated with MPOX. All of us on this call will be familiar with the stigma associated with HIV. And we know from the HIV response that stigma is best countered within communities. Working with communities will give us context sensitive solutions, interventions that will work and interventions that will be sustainable. The thing that I value most about working with communities and the majority of my work is in partnership with communities is the mutual learning and upskilling, not only the learning and upskilling for those community members, but only and but also for us as scientists. And finally, we are going to get the biggest impact, certainly with our research and with our policy, if we work hand in hand with community members. So hopefully I've given a very good advert for why we have to involve communities when we're thinking about the response to MPOX. And it's already ha happening. The communities have already been ahead of us in many ways in terms of the response to MPOX. Many communities building on the work that's been done within sexual health and HIV and very quickly, quickly pivoting um, their skills and their expertise to deal with MPOX. So we have seen a rise in community-led interventions, for instance, community-based health workers. We have seen some brilliant examples of health promotion that have been spearheaded by community activists, getting to, getting to communities faster than we would ever do and more effectively. Community activists have really spearheaded advocacy around MPOX and policy changes. They have been working tirelessly within their communities with great emotional labour to provide peer support. And finally, we have seen great involvement and increasing involvement of communities in research. And that's really what I want to focus on for the next few slides. So I want to start by talking to you a little bit about research that is ongoing, which really tries to engage not only with community experiences and lived experiences of MPOX, but also engages with the community to be able to conduct that research. 
Um, here, this is Verdi. Verdi um, is a study that I am involved in. I lead, co-lead the qualitative and interdisciplinary work in Verdi. Verdi is a research consortium of 30 centres of excellence that is looking not only at COVID, but also since 2022 at MPOX in a number of countries. The overall, the larger, broader study includes um, seroprevalence studies and uh, both paediatric and adult registries. But here I want to focus on the qualitative and participatory part of our work. So we are currently conducting qualitative and participatory research in four countries, Italy, Nigeria, Thailand and the United Kingdom. Each country is choosing methods that are feasible and appropriate for their site. So in Italy, they are looking at news media, but in other settings, not only are we looking at news media to track discourse around MPOX and representations of MPOX, for instance, what kind of language is being used, we're looking at social media and looking at innovative and newer social media platforms, such as TikTok, where predominantly younger people use uh, TikTok. We have been conducting focus groups with communities affected by MPOX and those communities differ according to which country we're working in. We are doing interviews with people affected by MPOX and also key stakeholders, including healthcare providers. And finally, in Thailand, they are just about to launch a participatory photography project. We believe that these innovative, um, highly community embedded approaches will allow us to get a more holistic view and also comparative view of MPOX and the experiences of people with MPOX across these settings. We also have an international community advisory board. Uh, this community advisory board is being led by three community partners. Some of you will know these partners well, the EATG, NAS, which is a UK-based charity that specifically looks at sexual health amongst racially minoritized communities, and AFRI Health in Nigeria. Our community advisory board is involved in reviewing all our documents. They provide feedback on the conduct, but also the design of the study. They have supported us in terms of being able to um, recruit participants, and they are guiding us in terms of dissemination and future development of this work. And we are very grateful for their input. So our previous chair, who's recently stepped down, told us when asked about why it was important for community to be involved in research. I believe that active community participation is essential for impactful research. It's crucial that this research addresses the real needs of those most affected. Given the inherent power dynamics in society, it's vital for me to feel that my input is being genuinely considered, not just heard as a research subject. This approach is key to effectively understanding and addressing health inequities. And I could not have put that better myself. We are not the only uh, research team that is looking at sort of innovative and community partnership working. So here I want to give you some examples. Um, all from the UK, I am conscious that there is work from other parts of the world as well and increasing amounts of work being conducted in high prevalence areas. So Tom May at uh, Bristol, who's been uh, conducting focus groups and interviews to look at health messaging. Um, Chloe Orkin and Sarah Paparini as part of the SHARE Collaborative, who've worked very closely with Love Tank to look at uh, community preferences and then uh, my colleague at UCL, Charlie Whitzel, who did some of the first work in the UK interviewing people who've been affected by MPOX. And I wanted to pull across some sort of common themes that emerges from this work, um, really to highlight how important it is to have that community voice. These studies have shown the central importance of stigma in prevention, accessing care, experiences of healthcare and mental health. They have highlighted the non-physical impacts of MPOX. They've showed that public health messaging is sometimes not understood or sometimes not taken on board. They've shown how community has been key to health messaging in MPOX, that personal stories and lived experience are important tools in terms of health promotion and advocacy. They've demonstrated the leveraging of community experience in sexual, sexual health and HIV and how this has really helped in terms of the response to MPOX. And they have highlighted the risk of amplifying health inequities if marginalized groups are not involved. So um, just as I end, 
I asked my colleague, Simon Collins, who many of you will know, to tell me what he thought the community priorities are at the moment. So Simon said, given the population approach to MPOX in the EU is eradication, routine access to effective vaccinations is the main community need. This has to be planned against the background of a single global manufacturer and the urgency of prioritising vaccines to Central Africa. As cases will continue in high income countries, healthcare needs to be person centred and non judgmental. With several surveys during 2022 reporting that healthcare didn't always have these qualities. So I'm going to end here. I need to acknowledge um, all these people here, including the Verdi Qualitative Study Team and our amazing Community Advisory Board. I hope in this short presentation I've highlighted the importance of community-led and community-involved responses to MPOX. And thank you. This was great, Shema. Thank you so much. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Dimi Ogoina. So the next three presenters will be sharing lessons learned from their country's, country's experiences in responding to MPOX. The, our first speaker in this, uh, among these three is Professor Dimi Ogoina, who is an infectious diseases physician and professor of medicine and infectious diseases at Niger Delta University. Uh, and at the Niger Delta University Teaching Hospital in Bayelsa in Nigeria. And he currently serves as the president of the Nigerian Infectious Diseases Society. Professor Wogoina will be presenting on the call to action for earlier global responses to neglected tropical and ancient diseases such as MPOX, perspectives from Nigeria and beyond. Jimmy, the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much, uh, Beatrice. I appreciate the society uh, for inviting me. And the topic is very clear, and I think uh, you have just repeated the topic. Uh, so I'll go straight to the next slide. Um, in terms of disclosure, I'm the chair of the WH Emergency Committee on, on the MPOX of uh, uh, But the views expressed in these slides are ent entirely my views and not the views of the WHO. Let Let's start from the beginning, giving an historical context uh, about MPOX, uh, the virus, and, and the likes. Of course, we know that the monkeypox virus is a DNA virus, a double-stranded DNA virus that uh, belongs to the genus of autopox virus um, with other autopox viruses, such as the variola virus that causes uh, smallpox. The first uh, case, uh, animal case of MPOX, or monkeypox, that, as it was called then, was in captive monkeys in 1958 that was described by von Magnus et al, uh, following exportation of uh, monkeys from Singapore to Denmark. But the first human case of MPOX was reported in the Basan Kusu district in the Democratic Republic of Congo in the year 1970. That's 12 years after the first animal case. Uh, this uh, was an unvaccinated um, nine-month-old boy that lived in a rural setting. Of course, we now know that uh, there are two distinct uh, genetic clades of the monkeypox Ox virus, uh, clade one, uh, are known to circulate within the Central African countries and uh, also been exported recently. Clade two, circulating within uh, West African countries, that uh, was responsible for the global outbreak in 2022. Uh, this just gives us an overview of uh, the tropical rainforest disease uh, that is MPOX of West and Central Africa between 1970 and 1987. You observe that most cases of MPOX between 1970 and 1987 occurred within the tropical rainforest areas. The studies indicated at that time that the population group mostly affected by uh, villages and settlements that were less than 5,000 persons, even some were less than 1,000 persons. Children were most infect, uh, impacted, and most cases were among children, and most of the children were actually less than 10 years, although the age has been changing over time. There was no significant gen gender predilection. Majority of the cases of MPOX that occurred uh, during this period was zoonotic related, 80% of cases, and uh, we had a few human to human transmission, but these uh, transmission ch chains were not uh, sustained. In terms of secondary attack rate, it varied from 0.2% to 7.9%. Uh, of course, it was uh, higher amongst those that were not uh, smallpox vaccinated. This table here gives us an overview of the number of cases of MPOX reported in the various countries. 10 countries that were reporting MPOX at that time in Central and West Africa. It shows that DRC reports uh, most of the cases and uh, partly attributed to the fact that WHO had an intensive surveillance 
uh, on account of the reason to uh, uh, eradicate uh, smallpox uh, in the DRC between 1981 and 1986. Nigeria had two cases in 1971, then one case in 1978. So Nigeria did not have any case of mpox until 2017 when there was a re-emergence of mpox in Nigeria. Uh, so this report by uh, Yinka Ogule Tao gives an overview of uh, that outbreak of mpox in Nigeria in 2017. And what was unique about this outbreak, this was the first time that mpox was being observed amongst young adults, predominantly young adults, urban dwellers. It was also the first time mpox was being reported in closed settings. So a number of cases of mpox were reported in prison settings. And uh, within a space of three months, uh, the disease became geographically dispersed. So close to 14 states and the federal capital territory, especially states in the southern part of Nigeria, were reporting mpox within a space of three months, suggesting that the virus was circulating before then. We also looked at mpox in our facility uh, where I work, and we observed unusual findings. Uh, for instance, young men and a few women having unusual genital ulcers, and uh, some also had syphilis co-infections, and most were actually males. And this was the first time we proposed uh, that mpox is there's a likelihood that mpox is transmitted via uh, sexual contact. Uh, we also described for the first time uh, the adverse relationship between mpox and uh, HIV infection, where people with uh, people living with HIV had more severe disease. So I just want to give an overview of mpox in Nigeria between 2017 and 2024. Uh, you can see the map here just gives you the idea that between 2017 and 2024, uh, almost all the states in Nigeria have reported mpox uh, except one. Majority of the cases are males. 68% uh, of cases uh, have been males consistently over time. And if you look at this line chart uh, giving you uh, the overview of cases, monthly cases, you will notice that most of the cases were reported in 2022, then in 2027. Uh, we had reported insignificant number of cases in 2024 until after the public health emergency was uh, declared and the cases have started to, to rise, although it seems as if it is stabilizing now. Uh, so 2024 cases are rising following the declaration of public health emergency. Uh, this table gives an overview of the number of cases seen uh, between 2017 and their age distribution. You, you look down below, you will notice the number of cases, 88, then declined over time. Then there was a global outbreak, cases, rose to 762, then declined over time uh, to what we have reported now as at September 22nd or so. Uh, we have 72 cases in Nigeria. Remarkably, all most of the cases were young adults between 21 to 40 years, as opposed to what we are witnessing in the DRC, where, especially in the endemic region of DRC, where most of the cases are children. But it's also worthy of note that since 2023, uh, it seems as if more cases have been de detected in children less than 10 years. And this could have implications. Does it mean that the virus is circulating more in the community and adults are not presenting and it's getting more to children? And it's an area that we need to look at in the country. This just gives a trend of cases, the CFRO and test positivity rate. Uh, this chart is just to give us some change that has occurred since 2023. And if you look at 2023 and 2024, you'll know that the test positivity rate has declined significantly uh, to 8.3% and 6.6% respectively. Before then, it was largely above 25%, and that is actually significant. So what it means is that we have a number of suspected cases of mpox that are turning out to be negative, and that's something that we need to closely look at. Look at. This um, epidemic curve gives us an overview of number of cases and shows that cases are rising following the declaration of public health emergency of uh, international concern by the WHO and the African CDC. So, of course, uh, we already know that uh, the origins of the global outbreak is from the Nigerian outbreak. In 2017, this, this is just uh, a genetic um, um, map, uh, just giving us an expression of clear 2B. In 2017, 2018, we had the monkeypox uh, outbreak in uh, Nigeria. Uh, then in 2018 to 2019, there was exportation of mpox. A dozen of cases were, well, less than seven cases were exported to the Singapore, Israel, and United Kingdom. In 2021, there was also exportation from Nigeria uh, to the United States uh, in uh, 2021. Then in 2022, we had a global outbreak. And you observe that the strain, the, the lineages of the clade 2B itself, they have a common ancestor. Uh, molecular clock analysis has shown that um, the spread, the origins of the global outbreak, of course, the Nigerian outbreak started perhaps around 2016. A recent study has even suggested perhaps it started around 2014. 
And what that means is that there was undetected person-to-person -person transmission of mpox in Nigeria. And it was largely person-to-person -person because of the genetic makeup of that strain, which is Apobec related, which is human activity related uh, uh, mutation. And uh, subsequently it was detected in Nigeria in 2017, then spread across the globe. All right, so what are these historical trends of mpox uh, neglect? Because we, were, we want to emphasize some aspect of the neglect. I've just given a, a chart here that, that gives us an overview of the historical, most major historical happenings uh, relating to, to mpox. Between 1958 and 1970, there were a lot of uh, cases of smallpox, and the world was worried about smallpox. And uh, so to that extent, any is issue of pox-related skin eruptions were linked to smallpox. And most of the surveillance efforts were aimed at targeting and er eradicating smallpox. So mpox was neglected under the shadows of smallpox between 1958 and 1970. Between 1980 and 1987, it was regarded as a rural African disease. So nobody was even interested about that disease because it was occurring in settlements less than 1,000 population, 5,000 population. So it was neglected. There was no investment. Mpox was changing, especially in the DRC. And the increasing number of cases were being reported. The age distribution was changing. No more cases were being detected. But it was neglected because people felt at that time there was no sustained human to human transmission of the disease. Then in 2017, we reported an outbreak in Nigeria, and we reported a potential of sexual transmission of mpox, but this was neglected for close to five years until the 2022 outbreak. So between 1958 and 2021, there have been limited research and development related to mpox. Most of the research and development related to mpox have been occurred following the 2022 outbreak. So in 2022, what happened? Vaccines became available for mpox. Well, unfortunately, African countries did not have access to vaccines. It's just now in 2024 that African countries are now having access to vaccines. So there was neglect, issues of inequity. So what we have had is a situation where it took 52 years for us to begin to test clinical efficacy trials, phase three clinical efficacy trials for mpox, a sign of neglect. It took 52 years for us to think about rapid diagnosis for mpox. It took 52 years for us to change the name from monkeypox to mpox, which are features of neglect. What is What does the future hold? The future is uncertain, I would say, because there are still many largely unknowns, a disease that has been with us for 54 years, so many unknowns about the disease. We don't know about the natural reservoir. We don't know about the duration of protection uh, that the vaccines will offer. We don't even know whether the vaccines will be protective against children less than 10 years. Although theoretically we believe it will be protective. So there are several unknowns about the mpox uh, that there is need for us to take concerted effort to address this problem. So what's the way forward? One, it's important that African countries own and invest in their problem. And the problem that African countries have now is mpox. Mpox has been with us for 54 years, but we don't fully understand this disease. So it behoves on us to invest sustainably on Mpox uh, so that we can understand the context better and develop preventive start strategies that apply to Africa. Global sustainable partnership is also very important. Of course, we have limited resources, competing demands, and so we require support from the Global North and the well-being philanthropies and other organizations to ensure we address the problem of Mpox. Research and development is a critical area that we need to look at uh, because there are so many things we don't know about mpox, so many under development, I would say, in medical countermeasures that we need to focus on in order to understand the disease uh, better. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you so much, Dimi. That was really an amazing uh, presentation. Thanks very much for being with us today. And uh, I would uh, like now to turn to Dr. Professor Jean-Jacques Muyembe. Uh, Dr. Muyembe, it's a great pleasure for us to have you with us, to have you here with us in this webinar. Professor Muyembe is the Director General of the National Institute for Biomedical Research, the INRB, National Public Health Laboratory in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, Professor Muyembe will be presenting to us on what we need and now, lessons learned from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Professor Muyembe, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Beatrice, for inviting me to this um, webinar. 
I will speak about the DRC historic leadership in monkeypox uh, research and response. Yes, in this map, you, you can see the, the first location of uh, monkeypox cases uh, in, in Africa. Uh, between 1970 uh, and 1986. Uh, most of cases uh, occurred in, uh, in DRC, as you can see. Um, so um, um, from uh, 1970 uh, to 1986, we conducted active surveillance, surveillance that showed that um, the epicenter of, uh, of uh, MPOX, uh, or cases uh, is a uh, uh, DRC. Uh, next, please. Next, please. Uh, so, um, yes, uh, excuse me. Um, go back, please. Yeah, during uh, this, uh, the, this year, uh, the cases of monkey boss were uh, sporadic, we can say uh, rare. And um, to, um, to stimulate the, the the findings of cases, uh, WHO uh, uh, put in place uh, this uh, incentive of uh, Congolese uh, currency, uh, 500 Zaire, it means um, $1,000 uh, no, $1, uh, to, 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 to give to somebody who can find uh, cases of monkeypox that that is confirmed by the lab, but so um, the, the the disease was very rare at that time. Uh, next, please. Next, please. Yes. So you can see on this uh, on, on this further. Um, in 1970, it is the first case of uh, human monkeypox detected in in, uh, in DRC. And we started the, the, the surveillance uh, until uh, 1980. Uh, cases were very, very rare. And um, from 1980 to 1995, WHO uh, 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 conducted uh, uh, intensive surveillance. Uh, this is uh, the team that was uh, responsible for this uh, active surveillance. And I was member of this uh, this team uh, from uh, 1980 to 1985. And uh, from uh, 19, 1999 to 1995, um, no cases were reported, but, uh, but after that, a number of cases uh, uh, began to increase. And, um, and finally, we, uh, we conduct uh, 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 an um, epidemiological research study uh, in the field. And the conclusion was that uh, there is a major increase in human monkeypox incidents uh, 30 years after smallpox vaccination campaign ceased in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Next, please. So um, you can see on this, uh, on the, on this uh, figure, uh, the incidence of uh, of uh, monkeypox in human monkeypox um, was was uh, we can say uh, very very the incidence were very low, uh, very low uh, in uh, between 1991 and 19 between 1981 and 1986, uh, but it was very high. Uh, uh, from and uh, from 2006 to 2007, and you see uh, below. Uh, see if you compare the population vaccinated with a uh, uh, smallpox va vaccine. Um, into in 1981, 1986, uh, most of our population has. The, the smallpox uh, scars. But 
during the, our um, survey in 2006-2007, only uh, people uh, more than 20, 20, more than 25 years uh, carried the the smallpox scars. So, uh, smallpox vaccine was protective uh, against um, mpox uh, disease. Next, please. Next, please. Next slide, please. So, um, I'm giving you, and, and the second study we, we conducted at that time was the clinical characterization of uh, mpox during 2007-2011 uh, in the Sankuru province. Um, so these are uh, in the left, you see the case of monkeypox with inguinal lymphadenopathy, uh, and the B is uh, the rash in the mouth, and the C in the palm, the rash in the palm of ants, and the D on the salt of feet. So lymphadenopathy was uh, the most important um, sign for us to um, to confirm clinically a case of uh, of uh, uh, mpox. Also, um, in the mpox, the rash, the, the the skin rash, is centrifugal distribution. First in the mouth, hands, palm of hands, salt of the feet then generalizes over the whole body. Uh, in case of uh, varicella, of chicken pox, the, the rash is, is centripetal. So you will see a lot of, of uh, skin uh, lesion on the, yeah, in, in the central of the, of, of, of the body. Next, please. Uh, so here we have the, the clinical aspect of MPOX. That's the severe cases in, in children and severe cases in, uh, in adults and benign case in children and subclinical infection in, uh, in adults. So lymphadenopathy is very important uh, to, uh, to detect, uh, to confirm, clinically to confirm the case of uh, and pox. Uh, next, please. Uh, so the complication of mpox mostly are bacteria. Um, so we have bacterial conjunctivitis uh, here and corneal opacity. Uh, next, please. Next, please. And also mucocutaneous complication of mpox, as you can see on these uh, different uh, uh, aspect of uh, the disease. Uh, next, please. And other clinical complication of mpox, uh, we, we see the case of keratitis and uh, staphyloma and calcification of the eye lesions and also secondary dermatitis and uh, uh, edema. Next, please. And finally, we have also um, the, the case of fetal demise due to uh, maternal market. Uh, abortion is a woman that is infected by, uh, by the virus, by the monkeypox monkey virus. Uh, next, please. Next, please. So the clinical differential, the, the differential diagnosis is, um, is to be called syphilis uh, and the syphilis and uh, mpox on the palm lesion, you see. And uh, below you have the, the residual scars of uh, mpox compared to residual scars of chicken pox. So this is very important for the clinician to make this uh, uh, differentiation between mpox and other common uh, diseases uh, in, uh, in Africa. Uh, next, please. 
So, um, as uh, Dr. Uh, Ogonia said, um, monkeypox is subdivided into two, uh, two clades. Uh, the clade one, that is the, the Congo basin clade, is subdivided into, uh, now it is subdivided into clade uh, 1A and 1B. So we, uh, we described recently the clade 1B uh, from, uh, from uh, the outbreak of uh, uh, MPOX in, uh, in a, a certain Kivu province in Kamituga. And uh, the clade 2 is subdivided into uh, a clade 2A and uh, clade 2B. And the clade 2B is what's responsible for the multi country outbreak of, uh, of MPOX. And now, uh, we have observed the, 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 the transmission, the sexual, heterosexual transmission with clade B. And uh, now clade B is circulating. There is a co-circulation of clade A, 1A, and 1B, and 1B in Kinshasa. Uh, as you can see on this map, um, for example, here in a uh, Limete and in the center, Limete uh, health zone, we have the circulation of clade one A and clade one B, uh, mostly uh, in a place called Tokasuma, uh, 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 where there is a lot of um, uh, sex workers there, but also the the clade one B is circulating on other places uh, in, a, in, a, in, in Kinshasa. So this is a, a very, very, very important concern for us to uh, control uh, this heterosexual transmission of MPOX in, uh, in DRC and main, mainly uh, here in the capital, Kinshasa. Next. Next. Yes. So, um, there is a, a, a difference in the presentation, clinical presentation of, uh, of uh, MPOX caused by clade one and clade, uh, clade one and clade two. So in clade one, most of uh, there is a, a, a lot of lesion, uh, and the characteristic to find is lesion on the, the, the palm of hands and sole of feet. But on the other side, you have a uh, 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 clade two, and clade two, uh, most of lesions are uh, on the on the on the genital uh, organ. As you can see uh, here, um, these are also appear in uh, Europe during the multi, multi outbreak, uh, multi country outbreak, uh, and the mortality is high. Uh, uh, with uh, clade one compared to uh, clade uh, clade two. Next, please. Next, please. Next, please. So, um, so what what we need now in the RC for the prevention, we need vaccine, and uh, the choice is uh, on genius. It is a live non-replicating vaccine produced from the MVABA strain, but not commercially available. Uh, for this vaccine, we we, uh, we, um, we, we need two uh, subcutaneous doses. So this, uh, this, for me, it is complicated to give one dose and to call the, the, the vaccinees again to receive the second dose, it will, be, it will not be easy. And uh, the second is the RC16M8. It is a live uh, minimally replicating vaccine yeah, virus uh, that is licensed in uh, Japan for smallpox and mpox uh, prevention. Uh, the, 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 the vaccine is given by single dose with bifurcated needle. And maybe um, the messenger RNA vaccine 
uh, that is uh, developed now by uh, Biotech will be also uh, uh, important for uh, the control of uh, of uh, mpox in uh, in uh, in Africa. So the most the most challenge the challenges the key challenges for that is difficult to access to vaccine and insecurity due to armed conflict in some affected uh, provinces like uh, in North Kivu and South Kivu and the problem of logistics for the distribution of uh, of the the vaccine and the other hand is the, the treatment as you see some cases are very severe and they need uh, therapeutics um, and the therapeutics um, we had the Covirimat that, uh, that is licensed by uh, Ampox treatment in the USA and UK. And uh, it was previously, previously used to treat patients with the CLAD 2 to be multi country outbreaks in 2022. But uh, we conducted uh, with uh, our program, Palm uh, 007. We conducted a double blind placebo control trial of the covirimat in patients infected with CLAD1 and pox virus from October 7 to 22 uh, uh, July 2024. Uh, um, in total, five, uh, five, yes, five, 597 patients um, underwent the uh, the and 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 there went uh, uh, the randomization to tecovirimat or placebo, and tecovirimat was safe, but days to lesion resolution did not differ by study arm. Nevertheless, overall mortality in our study was. Uh, 1.7 percent in each arm, lower than the 4.6 uh, percent uh, case fatality rate reported from the national recent epidemiological data. Uh, next, next. Um, so, I think the 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 three main factors for the increase in grade one impacts in the RC uh, are, are as follow. There is an increase of zoonotic transmission uh, due to bushmeat as the main source of animal protein in remote areas of the RC. There is an increase in the number of orthopox immune naive individuals in the RC since the cessation of uh, the vaccination against uh, mpox, uh, against smallpox. And finally, uh, there is a changing uh, epidemiology of mpox by heterosexual transmission through both clade 1A and clade 1B. So um, on the, you see the map of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the DRC on uh, the left. Uh, so um, all most of the provinces were were uh, uh, affected by the disease, except uh, in the south, uh, mainly in the Katanga uh, provinces. Next, please. Next. Okay. So um, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Muyendi. That was really a, a great presentation, a great overview. Thanks also for sharing the uh, highlights from the Palm 007 study. So we will now turn our eyes to uh, Latin America. Uh, I, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Mayara Seco. Mayara Seco is a researcher and infectious disease physician at the National Institutes of Infectious Diseases, Evandro Chagas, at Fiocruz in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And Dr. Seco will be presenting uh, on exploring the resurgence of a neglected disease, MPOX, lessons from the 2023-2024 MPOX outbreak in Brazil. Uh, Dr. Seco, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mayara. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here and to uh, learn from other colleagues from other parts of the world and to have the opportunity to share our experience in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I am infectious diseases doctor and clinical researcher at the National Institute of Infectious Diseases Evandro Chagas in Rio de Janeiro, Fiocruz. It's part of Fiocruz. And I am going today to present some data on our court, highlighting the lessons of a re-emerging neglected disease drawn after the identification of a new 23-24 MPOX outbreak in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. So the 2002 uh, multinational MPOX outbreak heavily affected the region of Americas. And as of January 24, Brazil ranks second in global number of cases reporting around 11,000 persons with confirmed MPOX. And despite a typical benign curse, MPOX can evolve into severe clinical manifestations, as mentioned before, especially among people living with HIV, with advanced immunosuppression. And worldwide, we have observed a decline in MPOX diagnosis following a peak between June and August 22. And this has been attributed to several potential factors, such as vaccination campaigns around the globe, community engagement, or even a cyclic virus behavior. And this global trend led to the end of MPOX public health emergence of international concern, as declared by the WHO in May 23. Despite the global diagnosis of MPOX in, 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 in 23, the situation was already changing in other parts of the world, including an increase in the number of cases in GRC in Southeast Asia. The situation, as previously mentioned by the other panelists, led to the declaration of MPOX as a public health emergence of international concern for the second time uh, in, in two years, in August 24. And in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro was one of the epicenters of the MPOX outbreak during the 22 multinational outbreak and the second most affected state in the country. And we at the Evandro Chagas National Institute of Infectious Diseases at Fiocruz, and we are the major infectious diseases referral center in Rio de Janeiro and promptly established the INI Fiocruz MPOX court. And this ongoing single center prospective court has enrolled individuals with suspected MPOX since June 22. And in the current analysis, we will present initial evidence of an emerging MPOX second outbreak in Rio de Janeiro, initiated in late September uh, 23. We included persons with confirmed MPOX and compared their characteristics according to time of diagnosis. During the first outbreak between June 22 and May 23, and the second and current outbreak from September 23 until the later, latest update on September 24. During the first outbreak, we enrolled 468 persons with confirmed MPOX, and between June and September 23, 64 persons with suspected MPOX were tested, but none of them confirmed. And striking since late September, we have observed a steady and progressive increase in MPOX diagnosis with 240 persons with confirmed MPOX until September 24. During this second outbreak, we can observe a peak of diagnosis in January 24, followed by a decrease but ever-present number of confirmed diagnoses, suggesting a steady community transmission in Rio de Janeiro. Since August 24, our diagnoses have also increased, probably also in the context of health emergence declaration and increase in clinical suspicion. It's important to mention here that until now, we have not identified the new subvariant declared 1B in Brazil. The second and current MPOX outbreak affects mostly young cisgender men between 30 and 39 years old. And even though both outbreaks have predominantly burned and cis men, in the first one, we observed more MPOX diagnosis among cis and transgender women 
while during the second, very few MPOX diagnoses have been reported in cis women and transgender women so far. Individuals self-reporting black or pardo have been disproportionately affected throughout both outbreaks, and compared to the first outbreak, the current one has more MPOX diagnoses among men who have sex with men with high level of education, especially those reporting higher number of sex partners and anal sex in the last 30 days prior to symptom onset. Notably, we observed a higher proportion of people on PrEP and people living with HIV among those with confirmed MPOX across both outbreaks. Overall, we observed a high prevalence of concomitant bacterial STIs, especially syphilis, as well as high rates of current or past hepatitis C virus infection. And from a clinical perspective, uh, characteristics were similar across uh, outbreaks. And it's important to mention that we had a high proportion of systemic signs, but this was not a universal finding. And we also have a high frequency of proctites and anogenital uh, lesions. And the time between symptoms onset and first medical evaluation was longer during the second outbreak and hospitalization rates were similar and around 10% in both outbreaks. Altogether, among the 361 participants diagnosed with MPOX and living with HIV during both outbreaks, about 15% had HIV viral loads higher than 200 cups per milliliter, whereas 13% had CD4 cell counts below 350 cells, evidencing an advanced degree of HIV-related immunosuppression. Higher rates of concomitant opportunistic infections have been reported, and MPOX-associated uh, immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome was suspected in about 4% of cases. Uh, this highlights the importance of further understanding the synergic interaction between MPOX and HIV co-infection. In conclusion, our work marks the inaugural report of a new and ongoing MPOX outbreak in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, following a period with no signs of sustained transmission in the country. Our findings suggest continual silent MPOX transmission and underdiagnosis, which could be related to low threshold of clinical suspicion, oligosymptomatic curses, compounded by the stigma that potentially deters LGBTQIA PM plus individuals from health services. Very importantly yet, no vaccination campaign has been implemented in the country. Our results emphasize therefore the crucial need to enhance continued surveillance strategies to promptly detect emergency STIs within the context of HIV care and prevention services. As community transmission advances, people living with HIV who are not engaged in HIV care both late presenters and those lost to follow up might be increasingly more affected, affected and vulnerable to severe courses of MPOX. And ultimately, the ongoing MPOX outbreak in Brazil and in the world showcases the importance of overcoming the barriers that relegate MPOX as a neglected disease. And this calls for consistent efforts to control MPOX, emphasizing the need for a more equitable distribution of health technologies, uh, technologies across the global, the global, and for tackling structural determinants that still impact on HIV continuum of care outcomes in countries from the global south. Thank you, everyone, uh, and the whole team that works with MPOX at Fiocruz, and that's all. Thank you so much, Mayara. That was a great presentation. We are now moving to our last presenter. So our last speaker is uh, Professor William Fisher. Uh, we, William is a pulmonary and critical care physician and director of the Emerging Pathogens at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine in the US. And he is an expert in severe emerging viral infections. Uh, Dr. Fisher will be presenting to us on updates from ongoing treatment trials on MPOX and the drug pipeline. 
believe the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being with us today. Great. Thank you so much, Beatrice, um, for inviting me and uh, for allowing me to be part of, um, I think, as a tour de force of, uh, of, of MPOX. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, I have eight minutes to try to provide a really high-level overview um, of updates from MPOX uh, random, uh, clinical trials, as well as to try to highlight what is in the therapeutic pipelines. This is a really nice chart of ther antiviral therapeutics that are currently being considered for MPOX. And this is a chart that comes from the International Pandemic Preparedness Secretariat. I'm primarily going to focus on the top two antivirals, um, largely because these are the, the principal therapeutics being considered in clinical trials. Um, so both of these, Tecovirmat and Brinsidofovir, are oral antivirals that actually have FDA approval for a different work. They're FDA approved for smallpox based on the animal um, as they demonstrated efficacy against other orthopox viruses in animal models. Tecovirumat uh, is an oral antiviral that targets the P37 uh, protein of, um, of orthopox viruses, which is um, highly conserved. And it's involved in uh, the last stage of, env uh, of virus envelope rat. Um, and it demonstrated efficacy against both mpox and rabbit pox in animal models. This is the therapeutic that's currently being evaluated in the most clinical trials. Dofovir, it's also an oral antiviral. It's a prodrug of cydofovir. It's got a lipid chain on its side that allows it to get inside of cells, uh, where it selectively inhibits orthopox uh, uh, viral DNA polymerase. It gets incorporated into the growing DNA chain and slows viral replication. I'll touch upon really quickly um, the Vaccinia immunoglobulin product. It's concentrated antibodies against the Vaccinia um, vaccine. Um, and uh, ha is available via um, expanded access INDs and can be considered in individuals who may not be able to uh, mount um, a humoral immune response. Now, the, the last antiviral that I'm just going to touch upon in the pipeline, and I hope I get to if there's enough time, are monoclonal antibodies. They've demonstrated remarkable efficacy against other severe viral infections, particularly Ebola virus, um, also led by uh, Professor Muyembe um, and, uh, and SARS-CoV-2. Uh, they've demonstrated nice efficacy in animal models, and at least two preparations are moving forward in clinical trials uh, in phase one studies in the next year. Um, so one of the challenges with uh, conducting clinical research in public health emergencies is really mobilizing um, all of the resources and getting the necessary regulatory approvals to initiate a clinical trial. Um, and so typically they are delayed we've actually seen a pretty rapid response to the development and initiation of clinical trial uh, studies against MPOX. And this is in large part due to really strong international collaboration that I'm gonna to touch upon. And the other problem though, because you can see that the, the platinum study started just a month after the public health emergency of international concern declaration, followed shortly thereafter by the STOMP trial um, and by the UNITY trial. The other concern or the other challenge I would say are the shifting nature of epidemics. And you can see, if you look at the green curve, that's the curve that follows confirmed cases on the y-axis over time on the x-axis in Europe. And you can see that that peaks before the peak, the orange peak, which is North America, uh, followed by the purple peak, which is um, South America. So they're shifting um, case numbers um, in different locations. And so international collaboration, I think, is really critical uh, to really identify uh, which therapeutics are safe and effective as quickly as possible. So I'm going to start with the POMS 007 study that uh, Prof. Miyembe uh, talked about, because I, I think it's really remarkable for three critical reasons. Number one is it's a really well done, randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blinded study evaluating safety and efficacy of tecovirumab. Um, they enrolled adult and pediatric uh, participants with MPOX of any duration, um, who were affected by clade one virus. Now these, uh, these participants were hospitalized where they were afforded really strong, robust clinical care as well as the full 14 day course of tecovirumab. And the primary outcome of this study was time to lesion resolution, um, which is where all lesions are scabbed, desquamated, or a new layer of epidermis. This is gonna be important because this clinical trial really informed all subsequent clinical trials. And I think this speaks to um, the international collaboration led by Prof. Miyembe and um, um, uh, uh, um, Prof. Uh, uh, Mbala and uh, Dr. Tishani and Dr. Newsomblatt, who led this study. Now, as uh, Prof. Miyembe mentioned, uh, in August, 
top line results were released that demonstrated that although uh, tecoviramat was safe um, and well tolerated in clade one disease, it did not improve clade one and pox resolution. Um, as he mentioned, which is also really, really important, was that the mortality was much lower than what's been reported in uh, the rest of the country. The mortality was decreased to 1.7%. And I, and I compared to, to, to 4.6%, as he mentioned earlier. And I think this really highlights that better outcomes can be achieved with really good, high supportive, uh, quality, high quality supportive care. And that really is the foundation of all the care um, and, uh, and treatments that we provide. Now, that was the, mo that was the model. And they shared their clinical trial uh, protocol with all other investigators that then were able to rapidly develop clinical trial protocols and implement them in other parts of the world so that we can chase this um, evolving epidemic. I'm going to highlight three of the uh, of the five really quickly um, here. The STOMP trial is an NIH-sponsored uh, study uh, that is enrolling in the United States, Mexico, Japan, Peru, Thailand, Brazil, and Argentina. Uh, the UNITY trial, a similarly multinational study, really targeting or enrolling individuals in Switzerland, Argentina, and Brazil. And then Platinum is a UK-based study. Now, they're all randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blinded studies evaluating safety and efficacy of tecovirumab. And there's some subtle differences in study participants and objectives um, that, that I can highlight. But, but overall, there's really nice overlap between these studies, which allows a deeper um, combined analysis after the studies are completed. There, um, the STOMP study uh, and the PLATINUM study enroll participants of any age, whereas the UNITY trial is restricted to individuals over the age of 14. This probably plays a little, uh, very little difference overall, given that the CLADE-2 um, outbreak that these trials are operating in is largely in adults. Um, similarly, uh, the UNITY trial and PLATINUM trial are enrolling individuals of any, with MPOX of any duration, whereas uh, the STOMP participants are restricted to those less than 14 days, really trying to target Earlier time frame. But again, I think there's pretty good overlap in terms of the study participants. Study objectives, DOMP and Platinum's uh, primary objective is time to lesion resolution, which directly mirrors the clinical trial of POM007, um, whereas the UNITY trial is really looking at time to complete lesion healing. And that's really defined by all of the lesions have healed, um, all, all of the scabs have fallen off, and a new layer of skin uh, is underneath. And that directly mirrors the WHO core protocol. There are some important key secondary endpoints. They all look at viral clearance. Um, they And the STOMP trial in particular is looking at patient-reported outcomes of, of pain, which I think is going to be really important given the symptomatic nature um, of this disease. There are two other clinical trials that I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on, but I want to highlight this, this platform because I think it's incredibly innovative. The epoxy trial is another randomized placebo-controlled trial of tecovirumab uh, that's being conducted in Europe in adults over the age of 18. And MOSA is a really nice, uh, nicely designed trial um, that is randomized placebo-controlled trial looking at tecovirumab in endemic countries in individuals over the age of 14. And I should say that MOSA is actually a platform trial. So there's going to be more than one um, antiviral potentially uh, being evaluated. Now, now the epoxy and MOSA and UNITY trials are really, they're all based on the WHO core protocol. And they're really part of this innovative coordinated clinical trial platform that allows each trial to operate as independent trials, but it affords the opportunity to pool and share resources, including shared DSMB, data management, pharma vigilance. And I think that allows um, continued enrollment where there are, are shifts in the epidemic a better global representation of participants and the opportunity for rapid uh, joint analysis. And so I, I think this is a model for future public health events and um, and just um, wanted to highlight, I think, really important work. Now, I have saw, I did see in the chat questions about resistance. We have seen resistance. We have detected resistance uh, to tecovirumab. This is data, uh, or this is work largely led by CDC, which is um, really, really important. And so evaluating um, other antivirals is going to be important, especially after the top line results from Palm 007. Um, another agent that's being considered is Brinzidovir. It was used in three patients in the UK at the very beginning of the outbreak. These individuals were treated about seven days after the onset of, uh, of symptoms. All three of them developed elevation of LFTs. It's not clear if it was due to the therapeutic or if it was just part of MPOX, which we can see. Um, and it is available through an expanded access this IND program um, in the United States um, for individuals who have significant progression while on tecovirumab 
um, or who are severely immunodeficient. And it's used often in combination with tecovirumab. There is some synergy data in preclinical models, uh, particularly of cowpox, uh, suggesting that these two may work together well. Um, lastly, but not leastly, uh, not least, excuse me, are MPOX monoclonal antibodies. Um, they have been demonstrated to be effective in animal models. This is one example of monoclonal antibodies that were used in a mouse, in mouse model, demonstrating a time-dependent reduction in mortality, meaning that the earlier we use them, the better outcomes. At least two preparations are currently in development or in, are entering into phase one studies, likely in 2025. And so they're a little bit of time, uh, we're a little bit of time away before, um, before they'll be available. I think key questions for clinical trials moving forward are, do we have the right endpoint? Is time deletion resolution the right endpoint? Um, what is the role of assessing patient reported outcomes such as pain? Um, and, uh, and again, continued global collaboration is going to be critical uh, to address this global outbreak. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Billy, for the wonderful presentation. And thanks for being with us, especially uh, with the weather challenges that are going on in North Carolina. So this is really greatly uh, appreciated. So uh, thanks to all the presenters. We, you can now turn your uh, cameras on. We have a very few minutes for uh, a couple of questions. And uh, I would like uh, to take the opportunity for us to develop a bit more on vaccines and would please ask Meg if you could provide us an update on the expected. I know you have responded some questions online, but I think it's great for the larger audience to hear uh, some details from you. Uh, can you please provide us some kind of update on the expected timelines for vaccine availability? Uh, another question is when the DRC begins its vaccination this week, uh, which groups will get first? Uh, and if uh, people living with HIV will uh, be prioritized in this, in this uh, initial phase. Uh, and the last question on vaccines would be related to if the genus is as effective for clade 1B or and uh, 2, and if vaccines are safe for people living with HIV. So there is a lot of questions on vaccines, if you can help us. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope my other co-speakers can help fill in the gaps if I get anything incorrect. I put in the chat, currently right now, the vaccines that are being used and that are, are um, on their way and in DRC right now are vaccines that were developed for smallpox but have been used in the Mpox outbreaks. So there are three vaccines, one called the Bavarian Nordic um, MBA, uh, Bavarian Nordic, it is, um, that is the one that has been delivered in the greatest amounts to DRC. The other is the LC, uh, looking for my notes here, uh, and the other is the ACAM 2000. Now, for the, the LC, which is a live attenuated vaccination out of Japan, eventually there'll be some uh, of those vaccines going into countries because Japan has made some uh, donations, but for the LC16, the concern we have is it's a live attenuated. Um, so for those right now, um, we have a whole SAGE recommendation that I put in the chat that talks about which vaccines to use with which populations, et cetera. Um, right now, the vaccines should be starting in uh, DRC around the 4th or the 5th in the, in the um, Kivu region. This is what I'm told. And the as I mentioned in my notes, phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase one will be contacts and contacts of contacts. Um, those at greatest risk, like healthcare workers who are in the front line of caring for people with MPOX. And um, they should be based, and they'll be delivered based upon the epidemiology. They're being delivered through uh, support from the World Food Program, as well as UNICEF and the EPI program that's there but also with uh, the support of the polio vaccinators who are getting deployed from WHO, as well as um, the Red Cross, who's there on the ground. So using as many resources that are on the ground as possible. 
Phase two and phase three will expand to those who are considered at risk. And uh, so people living with HIV or people who believe they're at high risk are not being prioritized for phase one. It's really about the context of the context. However, in the context of the context, people who've been exposed, they have somebody in their household who's exposed. There may be people who have both are living with HIV or who have other risk factors. So it's not that um, there will be some inclusion of those people at highest risk included in that. Uh, but we know right now there are multiple different approaches and the goal here is to get the vaccines to stop transmission as soon as possible. The last thing I had said is stopping transmission is not just about the vaccine. It's about reducing risks. It's about um, reducing behaviors. It's about isolation for those who are ill. So it's all together. And we know that behavior change had a huge impact on the multi-country outbreak in 2022. Um, so uh, I think I answered most of the questions, but I would ask you to take a look at the SAGE recommendations that are gonna give you um, greater guidance around the vaccination. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Meg. The, uh, Jimmy, would you like to add anything on the vaccine side at this moment? Yeah, well, I'm not sure I have anything to add. I think uh, uh, Meg has given um, details and also made reference to the SAGE rep uh, recommendations, which are very clear. And I think it's important that um, our listeners make uh, that document uh, something they read uh, to get a clearer perspective on vaccines. The only thing I would say is that uh, we still have some to the best of my knowledge, we still have some uncertainties about uh, the duration of protection some of these vaccines uh, offer, uh, because the opportunity we have to use these vaccines is limited. It started in 2022. Uh, so we don't know the uh, duration of protective benefits uh, some of these vaccines will offer, and uh, we may have to wait. Uh, also, we don't also know the African context, uh, because these vaccines were tried in the global north amongst gay and bisexual men. Although phase one and phase two trials have shown that they're immunogenic, they are safe, uh, but we have not tried it in the African setting. I know there was a study that was done, a phase two study or so that was done in the DRC in 2018 uh, for the MVA vaccine, but in terms of phase three, clinical efficacy trials have not been done in Africa, and they, we have not done vaccine effectiveness studies in Africa. Uh, but uh, the science suggests that these vaccines will be effective for, for both clade one and clade two. Uh, so uh, it be also on us to, to to deploy these vaccines to African continent so that we can benefit uh, from the protective benefits, um, protective uh, benefit of, of the vaccines. But while doing this, it's important that we also do uh, we embed research in the deployment, and I think that is what the African countries are doing, especially in the DRC. Over. Thank you. So. Uh... In order to be mindful to everyone's uh, time, I would like to really thank everyone uh, for the participation. I think we had a wonderful webinar. We hope to continue this series uh, soon, and uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you.